Zechariah 7, 1 through 14. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Chislev. Now the people of Bethel had, sh had sent Sharzer and Regimelech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, Should I weep and abstain in the fifth month, as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, Say, say to all the people of the land and the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these seventy years, was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Were, the, were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous with her cities around her and the south and the low land were inhabited? And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the, for oh, yeah. uh, through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. As I called, and they would not hear, so they called. And I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. And I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations that they had not known. Thus the land they left was desolate, so that no one went to and fro, and the pleasant land was made desolate. This is the word of the Lord. Awesome. Thanks, Mary Thomas. I don't know if uh, you're anything like me, but um, it's, uh, I find myself so often kind of just going through life on autopilot, where you're just going through the motions and not really paying attention to what's happening around you. And then every now and, every now and then you, you'll have these moments where you start to um, see something in kind of a new way. And you're like, that's really odd that we do that as a society or, or as a family or whatever. And so uh, you just think about like Easter. Um, you know, the kids come down, or at least in our family, the kids come down and there's Easter baskets with Easter eggs filled with candy that the Easter bunny brought. And I remember at some point in my childhood starting to ask the question, what is the relationship between the bunny and the eggs? Is the bunny bringing the eggs or is the bunny laying the eggs? Because I'm, I'm no animal expert, but um, I don't think bunnies <laughs> lay eggs, do they? And so, you know, you ask this, you know, you're one of these things. Or you think about Christmas and you think... Um, we cut down trees and then bring them into our houses. There's a, um, a comedian, Jim Gaffigan, who has a whole bit on this, where he says that kind of sounds like the behavior of a drunk man, where uh, he does this thing where it's like the wife says, um, honey, why is there a pine tree in our living room? And the, the, you know, the guy's like, ah, we're going to decorate it for Jesus. And uh, then I'm going to hang my socks over the fireplace and fill them with candy. <laughs> and you're just like, you know, why, why do we do these things? It's interesting. Anyway, I bring this up because um, the people in Zechariah's day are asking a similar question in this passage. You know, in Zechariah's day, this is 518 B.C., and the story that they just lived was that there was this foreign army that came in and ransacked their city and destroyed their beloved temple and took all these people captive for decades, and then they eventually come back, and as they're kind of rebuilding their society, Zechariah has all these bizarro dreams and visions, and that's what we looked at kind of throughout the summer. But now we're at a point, which is two years after that, and the temple now is halfway built through that kind of time lapse, and they, they ask this question in verse 3, which is a little bit like, well, why are we doing this again? And, and so look at verse 3. This is, these are you know, these people with these names that are hard to pronounce. They send this delegation to these prophets and these priests, and they say, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Now, here's what's behind that. Um, they had had all these ritualistic fasts that the people of Israel had instituted on different months for different reasons. And the, the, month on, the, the fifth month fast 
was to mourn over and lament and remember the destruction of the temple. And so they're looking around and they're saying, okay, we're doing these things to mourn and to lament the hardships we've experienced, but we're not in exile anymore. We're back in our own city. The temple is kind of, I mean, it's halfway there. So do we need to keep this ritual going of fasting? Which is a fair question, I think. And it's, God's response to this question is fascinating because um, it's a yes or no question. And God takes two chapters to answer it. And his answer is basically this. Y'all are asking the wrong question. Because you're asking about fasting, and I'm not as interested in having my people be about external religious rituals as I am about my people being those who learn how to love. And so what he's going to show to them and what he's going to show to us is that if we're going to become people who love, there's something that we must know, there's something that we must do, and there's something that we must have. And so that's what I want to show you for the rest of our time uh, this morning, is if we're going to be people who are formed into the kind of people that God wants us to be, people who love, then there's something we must know, there's something we must do, and there's something we must have. So um, what do we have to know? Well, look at, um, look at this response in verse 5. Here's how God answers their question of, hey, do we need to keep doing this fast thing? Verse 5, say Say this to all the people of the land and the priests. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And now this is a rhetorical question. God's exposing something in them to say, all of your fasting was really for you. It was all selfishly motivated. You you went... um, uh, you went really hard in the paint with this ritual on fasting. You want to know if you need to keep doing that. But really, underneath it, it's, it's all for selfish reasons. In fact, he says in the very next verse, your feasting is really no different from your fasting. Look at verse 6. He says, and when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Now, you have to wonder, okay, how, how can fasting be selfish? Because it seems the opposite. It seems like it's, it's, it's an act of self-denial. You're, you're giving up something that you want, which is food or drink or whatever, for God. So how can fasting be a selfishly motivated thing? Uh, I've shared this illustration with you before, but I'm going to share it again because it's, uh, it's too perfect for the situation. But Charles Spurgeon came up with this parable. Charles Spurgeon was this famous... Uh, Uh, 19th century Baptist preacher, and he came up with this kind of made-up parable that goes like this. There was this king in a kingdom, and one day as he's sitting in his courts, one of his uh, servants, somebody from the kingdom, comes in, and it was this farmer that um, said, oh, king, I just think that you're awesome. I want to honor you. You're you're just. You're good. And I'm a farmer, and uh, I I grow carrots, and I just want to give you one of my carrots as just a token of thanks. And the king receives this carrot and says, wow, that is really generous. That is so kind of you. You know, I'm so moved by this. I want to give you a whole acre of my kingdom, a whole acre, another acre for you to farm and do your carrot thing, whatever you do, and I want you to enjoy it. And they leave. And and there was somebody else in the king's courts who overheard this whole conversation, this other servant, and he sees this and thinks, wow, if that's what you get... An acre of land for a carrot. Oh, my word. What would happen if I brought something even bigger, even better? So the next day, that servant comes in with like a stallion, this giant horse, and says, Oh, king, you are so wise and you are so just and you are so good. I wanted to honor you with this steed that you could ride upon through your kingdom, through ye kingdom. And um, as he says this, the, the, the king receives this gift and says, Wow, thank you. And the servant kind of awkwardly stands there and says, like, and? And the king says, ah, okay. Yesterday, that servant gave me the carrot, but you are giving yourself the horse. 
And the point's obvious. This is, you know, Charles Spurgeon trying to show that, oh, it really is possible to, to offer something to God and it really just be a sophisticated way to serve yourself. To say, look at this sacrifice, look at this obedience, look at the way that I'm giving, and it really be just this, this it, it, not a form of love, but a form of manipulation. That you're trying to put God in your debt, trying to twist his arm so that he gives you something that you really want. And that's not love. But, but here's what we have to know about ourselves. We have to know how deep this selfish instinct, manipulative instinct goes. Uh, Martin Luther uh, in his lecture on Romans, talks about how, the curvature of the soul. It's this amazing image where he says that, that fallen human nature is curved in on itself. It's a great, great image. But, but let me read you kind of a snippet of this quote. He says, Our nature is so deeply curved in on itself that it wickedly, curvedly, and viciously seeks to use all things even God, for its own sake. So here's what this could look like. It could look like, um, I've heard people tell me this before. I've heard somebody say, you know, Matt, I, uh, I wake up early in the morning, every morning, and I pray, and I read the Bible, because I found that when I do that, I just tend to have a better day. I just feel good after I do that. And you wonder, Okay, God could ask you the same question he's asking in this passage. When you wake up and you pray and you read the Bible, are you, who's, for whose sake are you doing that? Because it seems like you could get up and relate to God like he's a vending machine. I'm going to pump in the quarters of my Bible reading and my prayer, and I'm expecting that out should pop a good day, that I'm going to feel better. And so you're really doing it for your sake. Not for God's sake. I'm using God to get what I really want, which is a good day. We can do this with anything. We can do this with church attendance. We can do this with volunteering. We can do this with giving away our money. We, we, it's, it's so tricky because external, especially religious stuff, which are good things to do, it, it makes us feel good about ourselves and it tricks us into ignoring the motive underneath that maybe underneath what we're actually doing is trying to put God in our debt. I've got, okay, I've done this thing. I've sacrificed. I've fasted. Now you owe me. You need to give me something good now. And God's saying, for whose sake are you really doing it for? You need to know this about your heart, that it is it, so often the selfless things that we do are actually motivated by selfish reasons. So if we're going to be people who love, that's what we have to know, at least know that about ourselves. But, but secondly, there's, there's more. There's also something that we must do if we're going to be people who love. And, and to get into that, let's look at verse 8. Uh, it says this, And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. Now, God's painting a picture. He's kind of laying out a vision of this is what love looks like in practice. And he starts in the beginning in verse 9 by saying, render true judgments which is kind of a weird phrase, but it's, the translator is trying to translate this amazing uh, Hebrew word, mishpat, which, is trans, which is, you know, pops up in your English Bible a ton as the word justice. It's the same word that you find in Micah 6.8, the famous verse which says, uh, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Doing justice, it, it means to proactively... Um, uh, fight for equity and um, advocacy. It, it, it means to care for those who have needs. It means to speak up for those who um, don't have a voice. It means to move into the parts of society that are breaking down, falling apart, and to, and to meet it with generosity and to meet it with sacrifice and to meet it with love. That's what doing justice is. That's, this is why... In this passage, he starts talking about, um, in verse 10, the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, and the poor. There's a, a theologian has referred to this group as the, as the quartet of the vulnerable. 
because this little grouping of people kind of pops up all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. Because in this particular society, and in many ways in our own society, but especially back then, these were the people that represented the most vulnerable, the most uh, exposed, the most destitute. You, you think about widows and the fatherless. Those were people, that, orphans, these were people that lost their, kind of the main breadwinner of their home. And so this is somebody that, in this particular culture, didn't just lose the, the main provider, but also their protector. The man of the house was the protector of the house. So here, these are people that have left, been left with not just no financial resources, but nobody to defend them. Uh, sojourners were uh, immigrants. And so these are people who didn't have the same amount of rights as natural citizens, and so they're at a disadvantage. And then the poor are people that, for one reason or another, have experienced some misfortune, or, or for whatever the reason is, they are now financially, uh, economically deprived. And so these are the people in this particular context that are the most susceptible to being taken advantage of, the, the, the easiest to exploit, the easiest to use. And so that's why he says in this passage, not only do I not want you to exploit them or to oppress them, I want you to show kindness and mercy, to give away yourself for the sake of those that might be at the edges of society, who might be at the bottom of society. And it's almost like this conversation is going like this. They come to God and they're like, hey, do we need to keep fasting? And God says, okay, let me get this straight. You think what I care the most about is fasting. If, if you cared half as much about the oppressed and the poor and the vulnerable and the hurting and the lonely as you did about fasting, then maybe you'd begin to participate in my kingdom. And so what you see here is this instinct in God to work in us this, this, this pulling out of the curvature of our own soul towards, those, towards other people. That's what love is, is getting outside of yourself to move towards care for others, and particularly those who have extreme needs. You know, for some of us, um, Christianity has become a bit of a hobby for us. You know, I... Um, I, I have hobbies. You have, a ho you have hobbies, I'm guessing. Uh, I've recently gotten into cooking. I love to cook. Matt loves to cook. And I love to, um, I love to watch YouTube videos of my favorite chefs and, and cooks, and I, and I look up recipes, and I kind of try to learn different techniques. So how do you cut an onion or, you know, how, you know all these kind of different things. You buy, buy kitchen gadgets, and I spend time and money. It's a hobby. It's fun. And I think for some of us, Christianity has, is like a hobby. We relate to it like a hobby. We uh, read Christian books and listen to Christian podcasts and go to church and Bible studies and small groups, and we hang out with Christians, and we talk about Christian things, and spend a lot of time being Christians. And could it be that maybe we're so busy being Christians <laughs> that we've missed the point, and we're not actually loving people? we don't have time to love people because we're so busy being Christians. You see the irony? You see the challenge there? I, I remember, uh, I've had people ask me this question before, especially when I was um, in campus ministry, where people would ask me, Matt, do you think that I'm a bad Christian because I drink or because I don't read the Bible every day or because I don't go to church every single week? And I would say, no. We're bad Christians because we don't love the oppressed and we don't love the poor. We're bad Christians because we don't love truth and justice. We're bad Christians because we don't love our neighbors. There, there's this, um, there's a verse in Proverbs that just, it's just like taking a shoe to the face. It says this, Proverbs 21 verse 3, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. In other words, actually loving people, doing justice, righteousness, it matters more to the Lord. It's, it, it pleases and honors the Lord more than some external religious ritual. So, so what do we do? What, what must we do? We must love, especially the poor. We must do justice. In fact, for so many of our lives, mine included, the way that we structure our lives is to intentionally 
avoid the poor because poverty kind of impacts our property value and all the other things. And so that's why, for many of our lives, we don't naturally intersect with poverty. We avoid it. And so at Redeemer, every single week, we have all these different things for say, hey, you can volunteer at Advanced Memphis. You can be a tutor there. Uh, you, can, you can hook up and figure out what's going on at Hospitality Hub or Asha's Refuge and, or IJM and uh, join us as we go to South Memphis and do the garden thing or go to Binghampton and do the garden thing. There's all, there's all these different ways, but my point is, is that it requires intentionality and proact- being proactive about it because if your life is structured anything like mine, poverty and need is just not a natural part of it. But we're called to be people who love. Now, you might be hearing this, you might think, wait, 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 wait a second. Remember point one, all of that, everything we do is kind of selfish. How is this any different? Can't you just go and care for the poor and it just be a sophisticated way that we try to get brownie points from God? And, and so, so how, do, how is that, how is this call to love any, any different? How is caring for the poor actually not just selfishness? Well, let's look at the last thing. Last thing is what we need to have if we're going to be people who love. So, last idea, what we must have. And uh, when you get to the end of this passage, it's fascinating because the passage begins to say nothing that this passage is saying is new. This is all old news, all been said before. Uh, Verse 7, were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous? He's saying, look, y'all have heard all this before. But what went wrong? Well, look at verse 11. But they refused to pay attention. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and they stopped their ears that they might not hear. And they made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of, the host, the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. So here's what went wrong. They weren't receptive. They turn their backs and clog their ears and harden their hearts, and uh, that's ultimately why God says, that's why I sent you into exile in the first place. So what do we learn? What must we have? And here it is in a word, receptivity. What we must have if we're going to be people who love is to be receptive, to be open. And I think this is really, this is the crux of the matter. This is what separates every other religion from what you might call gospel Christianity, Because really, every other religion, if you boil it down, is is a system of of kind of hoops that you might jump through that you offer to God something to get something in return. Here's my devotion. Here's my beliefs. Here's my ethics. Here's my morality. And in return, God, give me heaven. Give me nirvana. Give me enlightenment. Give me something. But it's, it's... Religion is set up to, for you to offer something to God, and this is very different. This is showing up to receive something from God. This is showing up with nothing but openness. Tell me what to do. You provide, you give. I got nothing. Some of you might know that, um, you, you might know the, the, the kind of the new holiday, Bobby Bonilla Day. If you don't know Bobby Bonilla Day, in, in the professional baseball world, every July 1st is Bobby Bonilla Day. And here's the reason, here's the backstory. Bobby Bonilla was a big deal, baseball player in the 90s, played for the New York Mets. After the 1999 season with the Mets, he was effectively cut from the team. They restructured their team, didn't want him anymore, and so they cut him. But he had a $5.9 million contract that the Mets were still on the line, you know, still on the hook to pay. And so they could have paid it all right then in one lump sum and had been done with him. But they decided, instead of that, here's what we're going to do. We're going to defer your payments, and we're going to pay you $1.19 million for 25 years, starting in 2011, which I guess was 11 years after they kind of set this contract. And you think, that's a lot more money. Why in the world... Would they not just pay him five, you know, six million dollars right now instead of paying all of that down the road? And here's why: because all of the all of the owner's money uh, was tied in with Bernie Madoff, and they had been promised if you invest your millions with us, your your profits are going to be double, triple. And so they thought, oh my goodness, we're going to make more money if we invest his millions of dollars here instead of 
you know, we'll actually make more money in the long run. But of course, as history unfolded, the Madoff Ponzi scheme collapsed and was exposed and, you know, all kind of came out. And now they're on the line, they're on the hook to pay a million dollars every year for 25 years. So starting in July 1st, 2011, Bobby Bonilla gets a check in the mail for $1.19 million for doing nothing to not play baseball. And then he got another check the next year and the next year and the next year. So, so far, <laughs> so far, the Mets have paid him $14.3 million and they have $15.5 million left. It's going to happen for the next 13 years. It's the craziest sports contract story, which is its own genre of stories, by the way. The craziest sports contract story ever. Millions, millions to not play. When I heard that story, I thought, that's what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is someone who shows up with nothing and you get everything. This is why Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you can't even, you can't even enter into the kingdom. You know what, you know, a little child, you think about a baby, a baby contributes nothing. A, tr- a baby can't take care of itself. A baby is 100% receiver. And God says that's the picture of what it means to be a Christian. You show up as receiver, and I show up as provider. And so this is why the gospel is such good news, because God does everything for us. Jesus lived the life of love and mercy and justice and righteousness that you and I should have lived He died the death that you and I should have died. He was raised for us. He was ascended for us. He's seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us. He's doing everything, has done, is, and will do everything for us. You don't earn that. All you can do is receive that. When you begin to receive the generous, sacrificial, self-giving love of God, that's what activates something inside of you, where you become someone who loves This is why 1 John 4 says, we love, but because he first loved us. When when you know you have been loved like this, you know what it does? It it obliterates your pride. When you look at people who are um, financially destitute or socially at the margins of society, uh, economically broken, however you want to describe it, you see in them what, what you were spiritually, and so you, you, you have no more leg to, to feel superior to them. You see them and you say, this, if God was this merciful and kind to me when I've been a disaster, when I've been a wreck, when I've been poor, when I've been broken, how can I avoid someone like this? It, it creates compassion, empathy. You start to get creative of how, how can I care for and love these people that are basically just a mirror to me? And you know what it does? is once this love starts to get inside of you, it, um, it starts to deprogram that uh, manipulative instinct inside of all of us because you realize that God is a God of grace, and so I don't have to barter with him. I don't have to show up and give him reasons to bless me and reasons to love me. He just loves me because he loves me. That his love actually starts to undo that manipulative instinct so that you want to love him and you want to love other people, not to get something from God, but because you want to honor him. You want to please him. You want to bless his name. But here's the thing. You can't give away what you don't have. And so if we're going to be people who love, we must first receive. And then give it away, especially to those in need. So the invitation for you and for me this morning is uh, to show up with empty hands and to receive the love and the mercy of God and then to give it away to others. That's the invitation. Let me pray. Uh, Father, I I do pray that you would um, help um, us take our our white-knuckled grip off of the things that we think are justifying our existence. And I pray that you would give us the humility and the the neediness to come before you with empty hands, knowing in many ways we're just like uh, little children 
and 100% dependent on you for every breath, every heartbeat, every day, every moment. Father, get, get us in touch with our own need. Get us in touch with your own provision and generosity and transform us and make us into people who love. Not so that we can just manipulate you to baptize our agenda for our lives, but so that we might be people who love, fashioned after your image of the one who has given himself in love for us. Do that, please, we ask. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.